Come in, come in, come in. Can you hear me? Can you see me? That, wor- that works every time. Almost, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm Paul Everett. This is my third trip coming to Brazil to speak. My first trip, uh, Luciano invited me to Linux World Sao Paulo in 2000. Biggest talk I've ever given, 900 people. I did terrible. Second time, though, 2002, Fisla in Porto Alegre. I was invited to give a talk. And uh, my really good friend, Sidney, um, one of my favorite people in the world of Zoop, uh, he and I were over, well, I'd given my speeches, we were across town doing a sprint on the ZMI for Zoop 3, the future of the ZMI. We did a great job, as you can tell. This is a full view screen from yesterday. The ZMI hasn't moved an inch since then. Uh, Luciano, who I've known since 1999, um, one of the most important people in the early days of Zoop and Python anywhere in the world, not just in Brazil, uh, you and I have lasted longer than most marriages. In this infrared connection we have going on here, my wife is going to worry about that. So Luciano's over at the Sprint, phone rings, hello Luciano. It's the conference calling. It appears that the governor of Rio de Sud, is that right, is at the conference and he's going to issue a proclamation. Yeah, good, stay there. He's going to issue a proclamation. With the governor comes what? Cameras and newspaper reporters. And a proclamation requires a signature for the government and a signature from someone else. They wanted me to come back over and sign this proclamation. So Luciano and I get in the car. We drive real fast over to the conference. And in the car I'm with him, I'm like, dude, I don't speak Portuguese. I can't read Portuguese. How am I going to read this proclamation? I might be signing anything. So we worked out a little protocol. He was going to sneak in real quick, read the proclamation, and give me a thumbs up to let me know if it was okay. So I get there, crowds around, cameras are going, talking, I have to say some BS. And I go over and I'm I'm looking for Luciano and I can't find him and here's this proclamation and the cameras are there and everyone's looking. So I did what any honorable person would do. I signed my business partner's signature. So from that I learned a kind of early lesson about, uh, about signatures, but I learned a bigger lesson about the dark arts of marketing and storytelling. And it doesn't matter what you do, what you appear to do outweighs the reality any day of the week. Um, I would like to thank some people. I would like to thank some people who are very important getting little Polly all the way to Brazil without difficulty. I uh, couldn't have done that on my own. Uh, but equally, Uh, I know what it's like to run an organization and what it's like to be a volunteer at an organization. Everyone in a blue shirt, if you could stand up, please. Can you say it? And this goes for Michael in the booth as well, who has a hard job doing the translation from redneck to Portuguese. Okay. A little bit about me, uh, shameless promotion. Man, I'm old. Uh, I appreciate the conference staff going into the museum and getting a relic like me out and inviting me to come talk. Uh, This last year, or last month, was my 20th year on the web. I've been doing Python and web servers for 20 years. Uh, Now doing a company in Virginia, a generalist consulting with Chris McDonough and Trey Seaver, the Zope Mafia. We're working on Pyramid and a content framework on top of Pyramid called Substance D. uh, Chris McDonough has done a few things, uh, supervisor, et cetera. And before that, I was a bootstrapper for the Plone Board with Alan and some other people. We'll talk about that later. I was a co-founder of Zoop, and I was a bootstrapper for the Plone Software Foundation. Makes me feel old just talking about all this stuff. Uh, as a reminder, Carlos is doing a pyramid open space today at 5.30. This isn't for people who know what it is only. It's also for people who want to know what it is. We need to hear from you. Raise your hand if you've heard me talk before. <laughs> and you're back again, dummies. 
Uh, I give a content-free content guarantee you're not going to learn anything today. I do have a formula. Uh, unfortunately, the truth loses every time when there's a joke to be told. That doesn't mean I hate the truth. There is some truth in this talk. Let's go way back. 1993, I was a young Navy officer, really naive. And uh, sitting next to me was the guy who managed DNS for Navy.mil, for the domain Navy.mil. And I rolled over behind the, uh, the, the wall and I said, hey, can I have www.navy.mil? And he said, what's that? Young times, crazy age. And this is my very first appearance in Google in the Wayback Machine. Uh, this is me asking a question about compiling a web server in September of 1993. And I got answered by Mark Andreessen, the creator of the web browser and the founder of Netscape and the guy sitting on a stack of million dollar bills right now. Um, but I learned a little bit of a lesson at that time that you can ask a question. Now, as far as lessons go, this is kind of funny looking back on that. You know, current you goes into Google and looks back at old you and laughs at how naive you were back then. Back then, the discussion was about Gopher Plus and whether it was the future or whether the web. Don't think anyone's heard of Gopher Plus. Okay, now into Python. In 1994, there was a workshop at NIST, the very first Python workshop. Guido was uh, invited to come over there. And these are some of the pictures from people back then. This is a picture of me before I got married and discovered that $5 was not the right price for a haircut. <laughs> Dutch speakers, please tell me what orange boven <laughs> means and why it's in the background of this picture. I presume it's Dutch. I don't know. What? Okay. <laughs> Not on video. Uh, and so we had this workshop, and there were some lessons learned from it. Michael McLay and I worked on some bylaws for an organization that didn't exist. And Steve and I were talking this morning about Robert's Rules of Order and not getting dogmatic about policies ahead of reality and community momentum. We certainly didn't know that back then. There's a bigger lesson from that workshop, and I've really learned it over the years, seeing things come, succeed, go. Guido has been at this a long time. It was already successful enough in 1994 to reach across the ocean and get some redneck military officer to pay attention to it. And yet Python is getting even more popular now in 2013 as Guido steps back more. That ability to for a project to survive and thrive even after the original people depart is a rare thing to see. And the worlds of Plone and Python are both very good at it. Okay. Uh, 1996, uh, we started a company called Digital Creations. It was a joint venture between me and my college roommate, uh, Rob Page. We had a joint venture with a consortium of newspapers. They own 70%, we own 30%. This is a company photo. Weren't we so cute? Dumb, but cute. Uh, and we came up with this thing called object publishing. 1996. And it did some features. It had security and persistence and uh, marshalling and exception handling and stuff like that. Uh, it was pretty innovative. I got invited to be on a workshop with Tim Berners-Lee. Uh, I wrote a tech report for the W3C consortium. And this is a submission for IPC4, the International Python Conference. Let's see if this thing works. Yeah. Oh, go. Well, just read some of that stuff. This is the Dylan J. Dylan, are you in here? No. This is the Dylan J slide, because Dylan just had to deal with some people who pretend Zope doesn't exist. We were doing some cool stuff back then. Uh, so some of the lessons, uh, a couple of years after this, the 70% uh, owners said, hey, let's have a vote to dissolve the company. 70% of the hands went up. If there's going to be a majority owner, make sure it's you. 
Uh, uh, one more point on that. The word Bobo. Not the best name, right? <laughs> it was the day before the Python conference. We still didn't have a name. This is one of those true stories. And I'm sitting in the office and I thought, what is the stupidest name I could come up with so we would have to come back later and rename it? Bobo! Bobo had a commercial twin called Principia that we sold. Uh, had a lot more features in it. And it fit on a floppy with the Python interpreter on there. And we sold it to the Navy for $20,000. So we had to put it on a CD because you're not going to pay $20,000 for a floppy. But the problem was it was a CD-ROM with approximately 639 megabytes of free space on it. That didn't feel like $20,000 either. So what are we going to do? Gzip has this mode. You can say minus 9 to really compress it. You can say plus 9 to really expand it. If you run that thing several times, it feels like $20,000. <laughs> these were some of the things that, from a product marketing perspective at the time, these were the things we were telling people why you should buy it. And some of these things remain pretty cool today. The don't shoot yourself in the foot gets into our uh, hierarchical security model where you can let people have control and they pass on control and undo and things like that. And I'll talk about this later, the last point. You could program in a web browser. I'll, I'll just do one of these lessons, kind of a funny moment. So we've got us Plone people know about this object database thing. And so Jim started, Jim Fulton, the, the Pope of Plone, the, or Pope of Zope, the creator of Zope. I kept pushing him a little bit more. Can we have transactions? And one day, I remember this explicitly, he comes in, sits down, mad, looks at me and says, what do you think we are, a database company? Ha, 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 Jim. Ah, okay. Jim fell in love with the ZODB later. So 1998, we were trying to sell this $20,000 floppy. Wasn't going so well. And uh, we got a venture capitalist who gave us $750,000 because he used our, soft, our free open source software on Wall Street. Um, but we were still doing the same business model. The dark arts return. There's a Python conference in Houston. Alan, did I meet you then or later? Later. Python conference in Houston. Open source is just starting to be something that people think they should care about. This guy named Eric Raymond gets famous for poking Microsoft in the eye. And there's a reporter from the Washington Post, a big newspaper in the U.S., following Eric around. Well, Eric is giving a keynote at this conference. And so I see Eric Raymond, I see Washington Post reporter, I see opportunity. So I call back home and say, if we're going to do the open source decision, we're going to do it in time to get in the newspaper. So I go over, talk to the Washington Post guy, and I say my sentences carefully so I know this one will get in the newspaper. And I learned you can remote control a newspaper reporter because that was exactly what I expected to get in the newspaper. We went open source to get into a newspaper. But we didn't have a name for this thing because it was going to be a merger of Bobo and Principia. And the clock was on. People were really excited about this. I had to come up with a name. Didn't do so well last time. So I put out a call to the community. Hey, help us name this thing. This is my journal from the time. Can't read it because I have encrypted handwriting. And you see all these lines through it? The first 39 things were taken. Even back then, something.com was hard to find. A guy from the Pearl community came up with Zope. Four letters available. Done. <laughs> A year later, someone from Russia tells me Zope in Russian is. Some lessons that we came from that was we were doing a technology play at the Python conference, but this thing about the venture capitalists behind it became a business story that at that time was more important than the technology story. 
We are technologists. They are humans. Sometimes we have to learn how to talk to them. So we came up with the word soap in 99. Ever heard of it? <laughs> That's the bittersweet slide for me. In the business model part to this, the business story got to be pretty popular. I was on the road a lot giving speeches, for example, 2000 at Linux World. Go ahead. The most unfortunate first sentence in the history of my articles. Uh, I need to read this so it will be translated. History is littered with brilliant projects whose once, candle once burned brightly, but sadly flickered out. Go ahead. Uh, as the, in this on the way up phase, we learned a few lessons. Some negative lessons, like those first ones. Pearl for Zope. <laughs> Funny story. Product marketing. Uh, at the time of Bobo and Principia, we were hiding Python. We created this through the web experience for kind of programming where you didn't have to know Python because Python wasn't that popular. The original sin. Uh, it's the rest of this presentation is that. But that wasn't gonna be big enough. Pearl was where it was at. Pearl is the future. Pearl didn't have a content management system. Why don't we be the content management for system for Pearl? We paid $100,000 to get a Pearl runtime merged into Python. Two people used it. 2000, uh, International Python Conference 8, Arlington, Virginia, snowed like hell. This is also the Dylan J slide. Zope was starting to get big. Alan, is this where I met you? This is where I met you. Read the bottom part of this. I, well, I need to say it. Much of the growth in Python came from the increasing popularity of Zope, let the record show, nearly doubling the attendees at the conference. Some lessons from that. We did this by running a separate track in another room and attracting, instead of attracting programmers, we attracted humans. We created from the very beginning this idea in the world of Python that we weren't Python, which isn't surprising since we sold a commercial product that tried to hide Python. Uh, but even on the open source side, we approach the messaging and marketing as a different group, an issue that in the world of Plone we were talking about at breakfast this morning. Paul, if you're here, is that correct? Yep. And the other one was, if you read more of that article by Andrew, at the time it was the killer app for Python. It was the thing leading non-Python people to Python. And that created a little bit of friction with the Python community who didn't necessarily want someone else to put the crown on our head. They wanted the right to choose who was the killer app. 2000, uh, we get a small tidy sum of $12 million. $12 million. Uh, Chris McDonough walks into my office and says, if you do this, it'll never be the same. And I remember thinking, I've got 12 million reasons you're wrong. He was right. Things changed. Uh, we got a grown-up to become CEO. Uh, this is recorded. I won't tell you about him, but come and talk to me later, and I will tell you some funny stories. We also hired, uh, around that time, Guido and Barry and Fred and Jeremy and then later Tim Peters, Python Labs was at a Silicon Valley startup called Be Open. And it crashed and burned and everyone was worried. Python, people won't have a job. So we took on Python Labs and we paid for them for three years. They were expensive. Let me tell you what, we did a solid for the Python community on that. So the next time anyone gives Zope crap about Python, tell them to pay 
for Python labs for three years. Um, now, negatively, we were digital creations and we made Zope. We participated in the community with Zope. Luciano was down here pimping Zope all over the place. Our professional CEO thought we, we should rename the company Zope. This would have been funny, not, except I had just been spending a year giving a speech titled Perfect Distance, where I said there needed to be a perfect distance between the company and the open source product. If it's too close, everyone will think it's just a shill for the company. If it's too far, it won't feel safe. And so we did a name change, probably the most regrettable move uh, for, from my perspective. So things did change, and it's kind of simple to say things change. Things always change. But there are some lessons to learn from the change. You are who you are. You can't just wake up one day and pretend that you're grown-ups and tell all of your friends, piss off, and go try to sell to the big guy and all this other stuff. You have a culture and you have a reason for existence. And it's hard to just change because you got 12 million reasons to change. Okay? Okay? We had a big competitor at the time. Anyone ever heard it? Raise your hand if you've heard of Ars Digita. Digita. <laughs> uh, they were an open source content management system, community system, based on a programming language called TCL, Tickle. Raise your hand if you've ever used, no, 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 not I heard, used TCL. Okay, well, a few more. You people are old. <laughs> Ars Digita, they didn't just, they went way past $12 million, went straight to 34, $36 million. 18 months later, they were out of money. They went the Ferrari in the parking lot route. And this is the kind of news story you never want written about your company. Uh, born, flourished, died a horrible death. Uh, because they decided to port to Java. And the charismatic founder of the company left bought a boat, sailed the world for a year. Not a bad exit plan. Leaving behind the grown-up CEO to change everything, piss off your friends, your natural allies, and try to go win a battle that was hopeless. And this is similar to the discussion before. You can't be who you aren't. And they decided hey, there's money over there, we'll go over there. And things like that are pretty hard to pull off. Kind of a poignant, ironic slide for what's coming next. They should have just called it something different. Continued with the thing they were on, called it that, say, we, we, we promise to always support the TCL version. But they didn't. Zoop 3. Uh, this is Jim Fulton, the creator of Zoop, sitting next to Stefan Richter, one of the core contributors at the time. Stefan can drink a lot of milk. And we were uh, going through a process of learning the lessons from Zoop 2 and trying to come up with a better Zoop that solved the right kinds of problems the right kinds of ways. Very ambitious project very late project, very backwards incompatible project uh, that on one hand inflicted a lot of damage, perhaps the nail in the coffin damage for the killer app of Python, Zope. Um, but on the other hand, uh, created some fantastic ideas, very ambitious, forward looking kinds of things that people are talking about today. I'll make a brief tangent. 
Somebody was talking to me and Erico two days ago, not you, uh, about hearing a Python speech recently about a new system that was exactly the same as interfaces. Was anybody the person talking to me about that? Yes? Okay. So it was Rock. And Rock went up to them and said, do you realize you just described 2004? To the letter of the detail, it was exactly the same thing as the component architecture. And the guy said, never heard of it. So this is the cautionary tale for this. Uh, sorry, Michael, I won't be able to read all of this. I will try to come up with some important points. Philip Eby, several years ago, very famous person in Python core development, the creator of setup tools and easy install. 2006, even then, the story of Zope getting written out of history was starting to take root, mentioned all the kinds of things that Zope had already come up with that people were reinventing, and mentioning that uh, Zope was there first. Probably the best part of this presentation, 2003. What is this castle sprint I'm referring to? Well, there's got to be a castle, right? Castle sprint. This is a castle in Austria. The name of the castle is Goldegg. How do we know about this castle, you might ask? There's a prince, an actual prince in Austria, Philip Augsburg, who was one of the main people in Plone. Plone, this is 2003, was, Plone was already getting big, big enough to have a prince. Do you have a prince? Does your prince have a castle? Now, I'm not talking about Prince, the greatest rock star of all time. So he decided to have a development uh, activity, a sprint, at the castle and invited people. I think we had 40 people, over 40 people from at least 20 countries there for three days, along with two world-class, really world-class concert pianists playing Rachmaninoff together in his living room with the TV crew for a German television magazine doing a five-minute story broadcast to 40 million German speakers. There's dark arts. Uh, I got a little snippet in there, and, I was, and it was dubbed, and I was convinced they were going to use the voice of a little German girl for me. I was terrified. From this, I took some lessons, and it took a long time for me to see these. We had 40 people, over 40 people, from wildly different languages and cultures, who on their own money, poor people, us, poor people on their own money buying the plane ticket to go work for free on something given away for free. Why would you do this? And I, uh, It took me a while to realize this, and this is true about all of you because you're here at an open source conference. You're awesome, but there's more to it than that. You were all the smartest people in your school when you grew up, and people didn't understand you, most likely. And then you needed to go get a, a job, and that job maybe was going to be programming at some soulless, life-sucking corporation that you hated, but you got some good money on it. And then you go online, and there's this plone thing, and they are filled with other smart people just like you, who grew up just like you, had the same kinds of experiences, and they say, hey, you know what? You're smart and we want you, and you come in, and you participate, and you make friends with people all over the world, and you get to go to a castle in Austria. I was living in uh, France at the time, and I had my family with me, and my five-year-old daughter, I said, we're going to a castle to see a prince, and she said, wait. She ran to her room. 
came back with a Disney costume, big yellow dress. I said, what's that for? If I'm going to meet a prince, I've got to look like a princess. Those are good stories. About these people, there's got to be one who's the best example. We had a great friend of ours fit everything that I just said. The smartest person, the kindest person, the hardest working person, Dornellis. He's gone, but he will never be away from us. And as long as I'm giving a keynote, I will try to put this in here. <laughs> 2004, Plone's getting big. We got a castle. We got a whole bunch of software that people seem to like. It's owned by the Plone Group. What is the Plone Group? It doesn't exist. We weren't supposed to say that. It was three people who never actually created the Plone Group. Alan, Alex, and Vidar. So Alan gives me a call. Paul, I've got a great idea. I didn't hang up. Should have. I've been talking to computer associates. Should have hung up. They want to give us a hundred thousand... No, go back. They want to give us $100,000 to start a Plone Foundation. Why do they want to do that? So that they can negotiate with us to buy Plone back and put it in a commercial product. So we did it, even though Computer Associates was not the most reputable company in the world. At that time, it was... Um, quite a name to be associated with. But they followed through, they deposited money in the bank, and through that entire effort, we had to create something that could cash the damn check. Can't give it to the Plone Group, they don't exist. So we went through this process to create the Plone Foundation. Wonderful, interesting process. The way that it went about, the way Alex and Alan in particular went about it, you don't have anybody that could put the crown on the head. And that was a challenge. So you have to go earn it. You have to, you can't be given legitimacy. Legitimacy has to be granted. We had to go to the Plone community and say, you are us, we are you, we are going to do this, what should we do? How should it look? What patterns should it follow? And out of that initial DNA, that initial culture that was created, is everything that remains with the Plone Foundation, the meeting last night, the, the new board that's coming in. Plone the software, great success story. Plone the foundation, that is a neat story, should be told more. Okay, well, that was 2004, 2010, little gap in the history. Uh, Chris McDonough, we come up with something called Pyramid. Where did this thing come from? <laughs> At the time, Chris had created something called Repose.bfg, the web framework after Zope was the way he viewed it. Uh, and at the time, there was a very popular web framework for Python called Pylons. Pylons was headed by Ben Bangert, and they knew they had a big change to make. They had some architectural issues. Ben was the benevolent dictator. Ben didn't want to be the benevolent dictator. Ben was tired of being benevolent dictator. It's not such a good job. How do you retire from being benevolent dictator? So Ben needed someone else to take over and a big pile of software to transition to. Chris had the big pile of software. Who wanted to be a big benevolent dictator? So, we met in Las Vegas with Turbo Gears to discuss a merger between Pylons and BFG. They provided the brand and the popularity. We're number two! Pylons was number two. That was our slogan. We so badly want to be number two. And Chris provided the software and the benevolent dictator. Well, the merged software needed a name. Don't ask me because I screwed that up. What are we going to call this thing? Why don't we name it after the hotel we stayed in, the hotel that has a beam of light shooting out of the top of it at night? Wouldn't that be cool? Hence the creation of Pyramid. The creator of Flask 
looked at this and said something that was really cool. Open source software doesn't merge. Open source software forks. This was the first time that two things came together instead of splitting apart, which is a neat service kind of to your users and your communities. And Chris has a different style than me. I mean, Chris has a different relationship with the truth than I do. Uh, and out of that, he has a lot of humility, and Pyramid itself has a way about itself where it earns its legitimacies rather than talking to a Washington Post reporter. Teleporting uh, closer to the future, as in last night. Uh, a lot of the speakers are staying at a hotel over here, and it has a restaurant with a bar outside. And it's a really nice bar. It's got wood deck and some couches and some nice staff, good service, a great menu. And right around the corner is this thing. It's a parking lot with some barbecue pits and an electric cord running across the street into some building to provide electricity and some plastic things that you sit on and a guy who has been serving food in this parking lot for 18 years, he planted the mango trees that we were sitting under. And people flock there at night, and you pay four reyes for a stuff. A kebab, a bowl of rice, a beer, and you're on the honor system. You just get as much as you want. At the end of the night, you go over to him, he says, eh, what'd you have? And you say, five. And you give him money, and everyone comes back the next night. Three nights in a row, we've gone to the parking lot for dinner. We could have stayed in the hotel, the fancy place, the grown-up place, the SharePoint place. Because you have to go to the SharePoint. Everyone goes to the SharePoint. Grown-ups. I mean, you want to be a grown-up, don't you? You want, to, you want to make a lot of money, right? You want to do it the, the safe way. Well, we went to the open source place. And there's always room for an open source place because when we left the parking lot, it was full. The bar was empty. Now, taking all of those perspectives that I've got, lessons learned, funny, semi-true stories... Um, and going to now life on planet Earth. Things look good. Uh, Python has never been stronger. Those ridiculous people with, with their photos at the workshop in 1994 are probably laughing at all of this, uh, at how this has all turned out, that we're sitting here in Brasilia talking about Python. Django is doing awesome, gets bigger, brings in new people. Uh, particularly the ladies in Django movement. That is fantastic. Uh, I'm happy with Pyramid and the thing on top of it, Subsist D. It feels fun. It's getting traction. And out of all of these experiences and stories and lessons learned, that gap between 2004 and 2010 was called life. And I decided to take all that fun open source stuff that I do and my daughter got in a sport, into a sport called Girls Lacrosse. In the first year, I stood on the sideline. Second year, I walked up a little closer. Like, hey, I'm here, I can help. Next year, I was a coach. Next year, I was the commissioner of the entire sport in the county. And that's because what we do in open source actually works in life in volunteering, in your local community. People organize not because SharePoint told them to. And at, this is my big strong daughter looking all tough. And these ideas about life and open source were fascinating and rewarding for me to kind of go off away from all of you people, learn about life in the real world, and then come back and re-engage and think about what it all means. And I've kind of relearned some lessons. And this is an important one. We only have one, one run-through with this. And um, 
not everybody makes the most out of their life. And uh, we do a good job at that. Best two words in any presentation. In conclusion, I've talked in this presentation about lessons learned. I think you can all tell it was just an excuse to tell some jokes. Uh, but we had a bunch of original sins that we made. That idea that we were trying to hide Python haunted us all the way in. It was an infection that got transferred to Plone, unfortunately. Uh, kind of the gap between Plone and the Python community. Hopefully that will change. This idea that you, you are who you are and no amount of venture capital is going to successfully change that. People do matter. And it's kind of given me a little bit of perspective on where we are right now and everything that we're doing. And in particular, we've got it really good. We, uh, anybody who chose to come to this conference, has it really good. We get to work and play in Python and Plum. We get to work on big, fun, challenging, intellectually stimulating problems. We get to play with people from countries all over the world and build these lifelong, no, 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 stay there, go back. Uh, build these lifelong relationships that are really rich and valuable. We get to take this work and this play and put it into efforts that benefit people and organizations all over the world. How fortunate we are to live a life of joy and purpose. Thank you. said that Zoak should have never been written in Python. Oh, I almost forgot this. Thank you. Do I, we have to get them out of here or can we talk? No, please. Is the time okay? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any questions or uh, funny stories? Okay. I'm going to say it in Portuguese, okay? Okay. Oh, but then you, you won't know. Okay, so I'll, I'll say in English. So I was actually affected by this, the decision to name Bobo, Bobo, because I had already sold the project that I was going to do it on Bobo, but then I was kind of, you know, dreading the day that I had to explain to them the technology that I chose, that it was called Bobo. So I was very happy when you released Zope. It's funny, there was a small group of people that really loved that name Bobo. They were unhappy to see it go. Any other questions or funny stories? Yes. Uh, so uh, uh, you said that you didn't, you regret, regretted uh, the decision to make Zope Corporation, name it Zope Corporation. So I'd like to say why, uh, to, to know why. Why did I regret it or why yeah. did we do it? Why did you regret it? Uh, I will take your question and make it into a question. Raise your hand if you were part of Zope at the time. Okay, a few people. Raise your hand if you thought that was a good idea. All of these people were making money off of Zope. And then we come in and we say, we're going to milk the cow and no one else can milk the cow. You guys can feed the cow, we're gonna milk the cow. That's not fair. And we needed them, because we were this teeny tiny little thing, we need them to bet their business on Zope. 
if they thought that we were making the company the same as the software, they wouldn't do that. So the first time I met Jim Fulton was at the Black Forest Zerp Sprint in 2008. And all we right. were all sitting on a long table and he was holding court about ZO protocols and that sort of thing. And at one point, he stopped what he was doing and looked up and said, I think I'm going to write a new micro framework. <laughs> said, all right, what are you going to call it? He said, I'm thinking Bobo. <laughs> so there is still a Bobo framework out there that you can get That's based true. on whiskey. That's true. So I have a, I have a, a true story that's pretty. Uh, this is Alan Runyon, the co-founder of Flow and co-creator. So this is this is a true story that's rather. We had a great friend of ours fit everything that I just said. The smartest person, the kindest person, the hardest working person, Dornellis. He's gone, but he will never be away from us. And as long as I'm giving a keynote, I will try to put this in here. Two thousand four, Plone's getting big. We got a castle. We got a whole bunch of software that people seem to like. It's owned by the Plone Group. What is the Plone Group? It doesn't exist. But we weren't supposed to say that. It was three people who never actually created the Plone Group. Alan, Alex, and Vidar. So Alan gives me a call. Paul, I've got a great idea. I didn't hang up. Should have. I've been talking to computer associates. Should have hung up. They want to give us a hundred thousand. No, go back. They want to give us a hundred thousand dollars to start a Plone Foundation. Why do they want to do that? So that they can negotiate with us to buy Plone back and put it in a commercial product. So we did it even though Computer Associates was not the most reputable company in the world. <laughs> At that time, it was um, quite a name to be associated with. But they followed through, they deposited money in the bank, and through that entire effort, we had to create something that could cash the damn check. Can't give it to the Plone Group, they don't exist. So we went through this process to create the Plone Foundation wonderful, interesting process. The way that it went about, the way Alex and Alan in particular went about it, you don't have anybody that could put the crown on the head. And that was a challenge. So you have to go earn it. You have to, you can't be given legitimacy. Legitimacy has to be granted. We had to go to the Plone community and say, you are us, we are you, we are going to do this, what should we do? How should it look? What pattern should it follow? And out of that initial DNA, that initial culture that was created, is everything that remains with the Plone Foundation, the meeting last night, the, the new board that's coming in. Plone the software, great success story. Plone the foundation, that is a neat story, should be told more. Okay, well, that was 2004. 2010, little gap in the history. Uh, Chris McDonough, we come up with something called Pyramid. Where did this thing come from? <laughs> At the time, Chris had created something called Repose.bfg, the web framework after Zope was the way he viewed it. Uh, and at the time, there was a very popular web framework for Python called Pylons. Pylons was headed by Ben Bangert, and they knew they had a big change to make. They had some architectural issues. Ben was the benevolent dictator. Ben didn't want to be the benevolent dictator. Ben was tired of being benevolent dictator. It's not such a good job. How do you retire from being benevolent dictator? 
So Ben needed someone else to take over and a big pile of software to transition to. Chris had the big pile of software. He wanted to be a benevolent dictator. So we met in Las Vegas with Turbo Gears to discuss a merger between Pylons and BFG. They provided the brand and the popularity. We're number two. Pylons was number two. That was our slogan. We so badly want to be number two. And Chris provided the software and the benevolent dictator. Well, the merged software needed a name. Don't ask me because I screwed that up. What are we going to call this thing? Why don't we name it after the hotel we stayed in, the hotel that has a beam of light shooting out of the top of it at night? Wouldn't that be cool? Hence the creation of Pyramid. The creator of Flask looked at this and said something that was really cool. Open source software doesn't merge. Open source software forks. This was the first time that two things came together instead of splitting apart, which is a neat service kind of to your users and your communities. And Chris has a different style than me. I mean, Chris has a different relationship with the truth than I do. Uh, and out of that, he has a lot of humility, and Pyramid itself has a way about itself where it earns its legitimacies rather than talking to a Washington Post reporter. Teleporting uh, closer to the future, as in last night. Uh, a lot of the speakers are staying at a hotel over here, and it has a restaurant with a bar outside. And it's a really nice bar. It's got wood deck and some couches and some nice staff, good service, a great menu. And right around the corner is this thing. It's a parking lot with some barbecue pits and an electric cord running across the street into some building to provide electricity and some plastic things that you sit on and a guy who has been serving food in this parking lot for 18 years, he planted the mango trees that we were sitting under. And people flock there at night, and you pay four reyes for a stuff. A kebab, a bowl of rice, a beer, and you're on the honor system. You just get as much as you want. At the end of the night, you go over to him, he says, eh, what'd you have? And you say, five. And you give him money, and everyone comes back the next night. Three nights in a row, we've gone to the parking lot for dinner. We could have stayed in the hotel, the fancy place, the grown-up place, the SharePoint place. Because you have to go to the SharePoint. Everyone goes to the SharePoint. Grown-ups, I mean, you want to be a grown-up, don't you? You want, to, you want to make a lot of money, right? You want to do it the, the safe way. Well, we went to the open source place. And there's always room for an open source place because when we left the parking lot, it was full. The bar was empty. Now, taking all of those perspectives that I've got, lessons learned, funny, semi-true stories... Um, and going to now life on planet Earth. Things look good. Uh, Python has never been stronger. Those ridiculous people with, with their photos at the workshop in 1994 are probably laughing at all of this, uh, at how this has all turned out, that we're sitting here in Brasilia talking about Python. Django is doing awesome, gets bigger, brings in new people. Uh, particularly the ladies in Django movement. That is fantastic. Uh, I'm happy with Pyramid and the thing on top of it, Subsist D. It feels fun. It's getting traction. And out of all of these experiences and stories and lessons learned, that gap between 2004 and 2010 was called life. And I decided to take all that fun open source stuff that I do and my daughter got in a sport, into a sport called Girls Lacrosse. In the first year, I stood on the sideline. Second year, I walked up a little closer. Like, hey, I'm here, I can help. Next year, I was a coach. 
Next year, I was the commissioner of the entire sport in the county. And that's because what we do in open source actually works in life. In volunteering, in your local community, people organize not because SharePoint told them to. And at, this is my big strong daughter looking all tough. And these ideas about life and open source were fascinating and rewarding for me to kind of go off away from all of you people, learn about life in the real world, and then come back and re-engage and think about what it all means. And I've kind of relearned some lessons. And this is an important one. We only have one, one run through with this. And, um, not everybody makes the most out of their life, and uh, we do a good job at that. Best two words in any presentation, in conclusion. I've talked in this presentation about lessons learned. I think you can all tell it was just an excuse to tell some jokes. Uh, but we had a bunch of original sins that we made. That idea that we were trying to hide Python haunted us all the way in. It was an infection that got transferred to Plone, unfortunately. Uh, kind of the gap between Plone and the Python community. Hopefully that will change. This idea that you, you are who you are and no amount of venture capital is going to successfully change that. People do matter. And it's kind of given me a little bit of perspective on where we are right now and everything that we're doing. And in particular, we've got it really good. We, uh, anybody who chose to come to this conference, has it really good. We get to work and play in Python and Plone. We get to work on big, fun, challenging, intellectually stimulating problems. We get to play with people from countries all over the world and build these lifelong, no, 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 stay there, go back. Uh, build these lifelong relationships that are really rich and valuable. We get to take this work and this play and put it into efforts that benefit people and organizations all over the world. How fortunate we are to live a life of joy and purpose. Thank you. said that Zope should have never been written in Python. Oh, I almost forgot this. Thank you. Do, I, do we have to get them out of here or can we talk? No, please. Is the time okay? Okay. Okay. Any questions or uh, funny stories? Okay. I'm going to say it in Portuguese, okay? Okay. Oh, but then you, you won't know. Okay, so I'll, I'll say it in English. So uh, I was actually affected by this, the decision to name Bobo, Bobo, because I had already sold the project that I was going to do it on Bobo, but then I was kind of, you know, dreading the day that I had to explain to them the technology that I chose, that it was called Bobo. So I was very happy when you released Zoop. It's funny, there was a small group of people that really loved that name Bobo. They were unhappy to see it go. Any other questions or funny stories? Yes. Uh, so uh, I 
you said that you didn't you regret regretted uh, the decision to make Zoop Corporation name it Zoop Corporation. So I'd like to say why uh, to to know why. Why did I regret it, or why yeah. did we do it? Why did you regret it? Uh, I will take your question and make it into a question. Raise your hand if you were part of Zoop at the time. Okay, a few people. Raise your hand if you thought that was a good idea. All of these people were making money off of Zoop. And then we come in and we say, we're going to milk the cow. And no one else can milk the cow. You guys can feed the cow. We're going to milk the cow. That's not fair. And we needed them, because we were this teeny tiny little thing, we need them to bet their business on Zoop. If they thought that we were making the company the same as the software, they wouldn't do that. So okay. the first time I met Hang Jim on. Fulton was at the Black Forest Zoop Sprint in 2008. And right. we were all sitting on a long table and he was holding court about Zio protocols and that sort of thing. And at one point, he stopped what he was doing and looked up and said, I think I'm going to write a new micro framework. <laughs> he said, all right, what are you going to call it? He said, I'm thinking Bobo. <laughs> so there is still a Bobo framework out there that you can get That's based true. on whiskey. That's true. So I have a, I have a, a true story that's pretty. Uh, this is Alan Runyon, the co-founder of Flown, co-creator. So this is this is a true story that's rather embarrassing, but it's funny because you cool, may have done something. that's so the best. You may have done something like this. I think the year is 2000, and we're doing uh, ASP and Com, maybe 99. I don't remember. And it was a very long night of e-commerce hacking and I think I was testing some mailing stuff sort of how we're generating mail and I have to differentiate what mails I'm sending out from what was previously done so what I do is I change the sincerely from the variable to Bobo the badass <laughs> in reference to uh, what Zope used to be because at this time I was looking at, at Zope well, that was at 3 o'clock in the morning. I went to sleep. Next thing you know, 9 a.m., the customer is calling. Oh, my God, I think we've been hacked. Our customers are getting emails that are saying, sincerely, Bobo the badass. <laughs> we've made, like, 400 sales, and they're asking who this Bobo is. <laughs> my humble pie. Embarrassing and funny, the best. Anybody else? All right, let's go have some. Oh, yes? Okay. Well, uh, thank you for your talk. And I would like to hear uh, any story about the time when you worked with Jim Fulton and Guido and Chin and Barry and mm -hmm. all these amazing guys. So is that any kind of That's funny not, <laughs> history? <laughs> years of stories on that. Uh, thank you for that. Um, so this one, you know, no one is going to get this far in watching this video. So I don't have to worry about what I say. Um, I had a slide that I removed because it's kind of embarrassing. <laughs> uh, around the, I don't know, time of Zope. So we have this object database in Python, and it stores pickles not the most normal format for your corporate data. And at the time, there's a small chance that your Bobo base, is what it was called then, or your ZODB, would get corrupted in some way. You know, some bytes got written into the middle, it can be read. So people would email their database to Jim. Jim uses Emacs, like 50 windows. And I've got a screenshot of Jim opening your 
Bobo base in Emacs, and it's like shit, vomit, garbage, puke, vomit, garbage, you know, pickle. And he's like, oh, yeah, there. <laughs> and he makes the one character change and emails it back to them. So the Jim Fulton database repair service was a funny time. And it's kind of funny, as prolific as Jim is, he can't type worth crap. And he types like he's pissed at the keyboard and he wants to kill it. And so he has mastered Emacs so that he never has to type again. So he does like control X V three twelve seven square root and acquisition gets written. Uh, God, I, I will tell you 50 other stories, but we've got to stop. Anybody else? Thank you for sticking around for so long. Let's go have some fun.